for quite some time, I have thought more of John chapter 1 verse 18 as an important part of the ministry that Jesus fulfilled. And since he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And this is a major part of the ministry we have to fulfill now that we are on earth as his witnesses. Here it says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son of God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So I would paraphrase that word like this, that because people had not seen no one has seen God, and yet when Jesus came, there were so many religious people, just like there are today. People gave their own you know, explanations of what God was like. It's like uh, if you think of a country where Nobody's seen an elephant and nobody's seen a picture of an elephant. In the days before, there were photographs and pictures. And nobody's ever heard of an elephant. And you ask 10 people sitting there to draw a picture of an elephant. None of them will draw it right. You know that. Because they've never seen an elephant. They've never seen a picture of an elephant. They'll all draw it wrong. Nobody will ever think of drawing a trunk. Because no animal has that. So think of that, when people who don't, never seen God, try to explain what God is like, or like atheists, imagine there is no God. Uh, you have all these multitudes of religions. It's not surprising if you put a thousand people to draw an elephant who have never seen one, you'll get a thousand different pictures, so you can have a thousand different religions. This is the reason why there are so many religions. And Jesus came into the world and even though that was a nation that for 1,500 years had the only book that God ever wrote, 39 books of the Old Testament, which is the Bible in those days, yet the people who read it formed their own opinion of what God was like after reading that book. Now one would think that if they're all reading the same book, you would get the same picture of God. But it was not true. There were so many different groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. And, and then Jesus came and he was completely different from them. The picture he portrayed of God was completely different from what those people had understood of God by reading the book. Jesus came because he knew the Father. And he was speaking from personal knowledge and experience. It was not the result of study. So what do we learn from that? that if you don't learn from the mistakes other people make, you'll make the same mistake yourself. So, you know, science has progressed because they've learned from the mistakes that earlier generations made. So, when I read the Bible and I see that these Pharisees and Sadducees had, had a Bible, they were very strict about it, they read it and they had a completely wrong concept of God. And there, um, some of you know of that little book I wrote called 50 Marks of Pharisees. If you haven't read it, you can read it sometime. It's online on our website. And yet, as you read it, remember, these were people who read the Bible every day or every Sabbath anyway. They believed in the Bible. They believed it and read it. And yet they were most 
unlike God. Why do I say that? Because who are the people reading the Bible today? Christians. Can read it every day and believe it. And your life can be most unlike God. That's what I learned from that. And if we don't learn from the mistakes of others, we will repeat it ourselves. But do you think those Pharisees believed that they were unlike God? Not at all. They thought, we are more like God than anybody else on earth. And that's exactly how many Christians feel today. We are more like God than anybody else on earth. You see, we can be ignorant of our condition. And ignorance is always the result of pride. A proud man will always be ignorant. The prouder you are, the more ignorant you are of your spiritual condition. Isn't it amazing that when God came to earth as a man, We read in John chapter 12, the Greeks came all the way and said to Philip, we want to see Jesus. The Romans, those are the great nations of those days, the Greeks and the Romans. The Roman leader Pilate said, hey, we don't want to kill this man. I don't think he's guilty. He's innocent. It's pretty obvious to me. You guys are all jealous of him. That's why you want to kill him. These were heathen who worshipped idols and Zeus and Apollo and all those Greek gods and I don't know what all gods the Romans had. They could recognize Jesus as not guilty and they wanted to see him. But the Pharisees who read the Bible said, no, he's the prince of devils, Beelzebub. They were so far wrong. Because they were not humble. If you read the Bible without humility, my brothers and sisters, you can be more wrong than the Hindus and Muslims, but you don't think so. You say, no, 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 we can't be more wrong than the Hindus and Muslims. Because you think so, you can be more wrong. Let me tell you that. That's what I learned from the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Pharisees and Sadducees said, no, we can't be wrong. If we really in the Bible. Well, those who have ears to hear should hear. Let me read a verse. And so that's why Jesus came to explain the Father and they couldn't accept it. Now let me read a verse in Acts chapter 13. You know, Paul, when he traveled, he went to the synagogues first to preach the gospel. He didn't go to the temple of Diana. He didn't go to the streets, first of all. I mean, a couple of occasions you see him Paul preaching in the streets, but most of the time he went to the synagogues because he felt that in the synagogues at least they got the Bible. Those guys, at least I can show them something from the Bible. And here's an, a message that he preached in the synagogue. In Acts 13, 15, it says, After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them. Now, Paul was not the type of person who would get up and arrogantly speak unless somebody asked him. He was a humble man. And they asked him, Brethren, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, say it. And, uh, and one of the things he said was, I want to tell you, fellas, verse 27, Acts 13, 27, those who live in Jerusalem, and their rulers. Rulers means the religious rulers, like we would call bishops, archbishops, or popes, or priests, or the religious rulers. They did not recognize him. They did not recognize that this Jesus was the fulfillment of what they were studying in the Bible for years. And they could not recognize the utterances of the prophets. That means they, that's in the Bible. They read the prophets and the prophets spoke about someone who would be born in Bethlehem, who would be despised and rejected of men, uh, who would have no external beauty to be attracted. And many, many things they said about him. One would be upheld by the father. 
And it was all there fulfilled in front of him and they couldn't recognize it. And they read that every Sabbath. See, they didn't have Bibles at home. So they would hear the word Bible only on a Saturday when they came to the synagogue. They heard it, heard it, heard it. I don't know how many years. And some of those Pharisees were 60, 70 years old. They had heard it for 50, 60 years of their life. Heard it, heard it, heard it. They thought they knew it better than anybody else. And they thought he was the prince of devils and uh, deceiver and killed him. And then though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. I just want to ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, do you feel, I'm talking about yourself, do you feel that you, when you read the Bible, you could be as wrong as they were? Or do you feel, no, no, it's not possible for me? That's exactly how they felt. It's not possible for me. That's why they were wrong. I've seen so many born-again believers who are completely wrong in their understanding of many scriptures because they're taken up with one verse. And the main reason I've discovered is I've, you know, it's been my uh, a privilege for me in many parts of the world to show people exactly what's written in scripture. Now I hear them say, people have been Christians for 20 years. Brother Zach, I never even knew that was in the Bible till you showed it to me. See, it was there all along. You guys have read it for 20 years. How is it you didn't see it? How is it you get a new Bible when you hear me speak? You know, I'm just reading what's written there. It's because we are so arrogant proud when we come to the Bible. We read a legal document more carefully than we read the Bible. Supposing you had a legal document that's going to involve you in $100,000, boy, you'd read it carefully. You'd go to some lawyer and ask him to read it and say, is there a little catchphrase in some of these fine print over here which I don't see? We don't respect God or his word sufficiently, even though think we do. We think our respect for God is by coming to church or by singing hymns. No, I don't think so. It says here that uh, in Matthew 11 and verse 25, Jesus said, Matthew 11, verse 25, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things. One would have thought that God wants to reveal everything about himself to people. But he's very eager to reveal, hey, you fellas, no. I'm God, I want you to know that. No. That's what you think, because you don't know God, you think like that. But do you know God hides things from people? It's true. It says there. And not only hides things, Jesus praised God that he hid these things. I praise you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and you revealed them to babes. Is there a single book in the world which only babies can understand, but clever people cannot? Think of any book on any subject, literature, mathematics, science, which only babies can understand, but clever people will not understand. There's only one book, it's the Bible. You know, when I first read this, I said, Lord, unfortunately, I'm intelligent. What do I do? <laughs> I didn't become intelligent. I was just born that way. I could have been born stupid. Most of you are intelligent. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here in the United States, from India anyway. A, is God against intelligent people? Does he make people intelligent and then says, I'm against you? How can that be? Why did Jesus say it's so difficult for the rich to enter God's kingdom? 
Was he against rich people? He wasn't against Abraham. He wasn't against Job. It's not the richness, the wealth, or the intelligence. The thing is, wealthy people tend to be proud. It's universal. You may not realize it, but if you're a little wealthy, you tend to be a little proud of it because you think you've got it by your ability or whatever it is. And you, there's a tendency to just look down a little bit on others who are not so well off, or not so cultured as you are. And the same thing with intelligent people. Intelligent people tend to look down a little bit on someone who's not so intelligent. I mean, it started in school. It started in first grade when you did well in first grade and there was other some dumb children there who didn't do so well. And from that time onwards, you as you've done more and more, better and better, as you went up to college, etc., there's a, an unconscious looking down on others who could not make it like you did. That's what makes you blind to the Bible. I'll tell you the truth. What is it that babes have, which clever, intelligent people don't have? Jesus said that. He said, if you humble yourself like a little child, you'll enter God's kingdom. Humility. You cannot beat a babe in humility. He's absolutely the greatest in humility because he doesn't have any high thoughts about itself. Absolute zero pride. So what the Lord was saying is, the humbler you are, the more you'll understand the Bible the more you'll understand God. He's got nothing to do with Bible knowledge, intelligence. Think of the person who's got maximum Bible knowledge, Satan. Nobody knows the Bible like him. He could even quote it to Jesus. But where is he? It's good to know the Bible. I mean, I've spent 55 years studying this book, and I still haven't got to the depths of it. But I've learned the importance of this verse. You, it's humble people that know the Bible. The humbler you are, the more you understand Scripture, because it's hidden. You know, once the disciples asked Jesus, and turn over the page to chapter 13, when Jesus spoke a parable, there were great multitudes, Matthew 13, 2, who came to him and he got into a boat and he, then he spoke many things, verse 3, to them in parables. And some of them I mentioned, he probably mentioned many more parables. And Jesus, the disciples came and said, why are you speaking to them in parables? Verse 10. Why are you speaking to them in parables? They don't understand what you're trying to say. Why don't you speak plainly? Instead of saying a sower seed, this uh, sowed a seed and the birds came and what does it mean? In fact, later on they asked him, what does it mean? And he explained to them in verse 18 onwards that the birds are the demons and the word sweet seed is the word of God. Why didn't he just say that? Why didn't he just say, you know, and he said, the sower is the son of man. He said, I've come here, instead of saying in parable, he could have said, I've come here to preach God's word to you. And I want you to know that the demons can come and take it out of your heart. Or, uh, you may not allow this word to go deep into your heart and then it won't bring forth fruit. Or even if it goes in, you'll allow the deceitfulness of riches and cares of this world to come and choke it. But if you allow it to go into a good ground, it'll produce wonderful fruit. No parable, simple. Everybody can understand. Why parables? He said, he gave the answer, verse 11. Because to you it has been given to know the mysteries, but to them, uh, to whom who has, it will more be given. Therefore I speak to them in parables, verse 13, here's the answer, that while seeing, they may not see, while hearing, they don't hear, 
they won't understand. Have you ever heard of a preacher trying to say, I'm preaching so that people don't understand what I'm saying? You got to know Jesus, and I believe very few people know Jesus, even those who read the Bible. They think Jesus came to explain something, making every, everything very simple. He makes it very simple to a humble person. It's very complicated to an intelligent person who can go completely astray if along with his intelligence he does not have a deep humility acknowledging that every bit of my intelligence is a gift from God does not make me superior to other human beings in the slightest way. If I'm wealthy, it's a 100% God's gift, not 99%, 100%. It's not my ability, it's not my cleverness, it's not because I did well in my business or because I was sharp. No, it's God's goodness, 100%. That person will understand the Bible. And that's why you have so many denominations in Christianity, not just hundreds of religions, but hundreds of denominations in Christianity, each thinking that we are right. Take out the Bible and say, we're right, everybody else is wrong. Well, I'll tell you who are wrong. The proud people are wrong. And the humblest people are right. So I would seek fellowship with the humblest people of all. They know God better. I've met humble Roman Catholics whose doctrine is wrong, but they know God better than a lot of Protestants. I'll tell you that. There are many Pentecostals who think, oh, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues. They are some of the proudest people I've ever met. They love money more than almost any other denomination in the world. You see all these television evangelists. Everyone speaks in tongues and they love money more than anybody else. I say, how is that? How can that be? This is not Jesus. Jesus didn't love money. So which Jesus are they proclaiming on television? It's another Jesus and so many people are falling for it. Well... I know why. Only because of pride. God allows certain people to be deceived. He says, in their case, verse 14, the prophecy is fulfilled. You will keep on hearing, but you won't understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. But the heart of these people has become dull. It's because of pride. Pride is in the heart. Then they won't understand and they, they will not hear properly and they won't understand and I cannot heal them, verse 15, last part. And that's why a relatively unlearned person like Peter, when Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? He didn't say Beelzebub, he, didn't say Beelzebub. he said, you're the son of God. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon. Matthew 16, 17, because your human cleverness, let me paraphrase it, Matthew 16, 17, your human cleverness did not reveal it to you. Flesh and blood did not reveal it to you. It is my Father in heaven. And so our calling, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. I see it myself clearly that my calling is to see the real Jesus to see the real God who is our Father. And the only way I can see that is by a deep humility as I come to the scriptures. Where I'm more trying to read the scriptures with my heart than with my head. You try to study the scriptures with the head, you'll go wrong. We have multitudes of Bible schools today. In 55 years of my life as a Christian, I have not been blessed by people who went to Bible schools. I'll tell you that. There are wonderful men of God who have blessed me, tremendously challenged me. Every one of them were people who never went to a Bible school. It's my testimony. And that starts with Peter and John and James and all the apostles. Uh, the only fellow who went to a Bible school was Paul in, in his unconverted days. He went for three years to uh, Gamaliel's Bible school in Jerusalem. And you know what God did when he got converted? You read in Galatians 1, God took him out to the desert of Arabia for three years. He says that in Galatians 1. 
Now, I wonder what was Paul doing in the desert for three years? God was getting all that chaff out of his system, which he had got from Gamaliel and say, I want to teach you something which Gamaliel could never teach you. Because he spent three years in Bible school, he had to go three years to the desert. And I believe that's what people need today as well. If they have unfortunately went to a Bible school, but people don't go to Bible school, to, to the desert. They go straight into a pulpit to preach. That's why you have so many denominations of Christianity. It's not by intelligence you know the scriptures. It's by humility. No single prophet in the Bible ever came out of a Bible school. There was a Bible school in the days of Elisha. You read about the sons of the prophets who are running a Bible school and they didn't know God. Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, John the Baptist, these people didn't go to Bible school. They, 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 they knew God alone in the desert and seeking God alone, they met with him. They knew God personally. I want to say, my dear brothers and sisters, it's possible that your knowledge of Jesus Christ is academic because you grew up from childhood. That's why, you know, when you're in a difficult situation, you get anxious and worried because you don't know God. You know the Bible, but you don't know God. But you don't have the heart of a child. It's so very, very important. So our calling is to show to the world, what does it mean to be a witness for Christ? To show to the world the real Jesus, the real God, by our life, by, the, by our way of life, and uh, by the things we live for. See, this is one reason in all the churches that we have planted in the last 40 years in India and other parts of the world, in the villages and cities, um, we have about a hundred elders now in 50, 60 churches. Every single one of them is unpaid. They don't get a salary. We are different from other churches and I'll tell you why. Because Jesus never gave a salary to his disciples. That's the only reason. Where in the Bible do you find uh, somebody being paid a salary for serving God. I'll tell you, you read in the book of Judges, there's a story of a man who said uh, to one man's uh, Levite saying, come and be my priest, I'll uh, give a new set of clothes every year and I'll pay you so much. <laughs> that, that's, and the guy led people astray to idol worship. Where did Christendom learn to pay a salary and an increment to pastors and preachers. It's not from the Bible. Show me in the Bible where any Jesus ever did that. It's from the corporate world. In the corporate world, and, how, and you know, when a church has lost a pastor, they hire one. Just like the CEOs. He is retired now. We've got to look for a CEO and they go search committee. We'll offer you so much. Will you be our pastor? And the, this is absolute nonsense. And then what I'm surprised is the multitude of dumb Christians who accept all that as if it is in the Bible. That's what surprises me most. So many things like this, which are so completely not in the Bible, and uh, human methods, because we don't know God, we don't know Jesus Christ. And when Jesus revealed the true God to people, for example, when he saw these people making money in the temple, selling doves and sheep. They were the fellows who were making money in the temple. Like a lot of preachers today make money in God's work. You know what he did? He drove them out. And the priests and all got offended. I believe when we preach the real Jesus and the real God, a lot of Christians are going to get offended. And when they get offended, you know that you're preaching the truth. They will get offended. I mean, if, you're, if your preaching doesn't offend anybody, brother, you're not a servant of God. Jesus offended lots of people with his preaching. The apostles offended people. In fact, they got so upset with Paul, they tried to kill him. 
Once Jesus was preaching, they pulled him down from the pulpit and tried to kill him. So what I'm trying to say is this, you know, this diplomatic, pleasant right to way of not offending anybody is not the picture of a prophet in the Bible. These are earthly managers who call themselves preachers and pastors. If you want to represent Christ properly to the world, recognize that the world does not appreciate Jesus Christ. If Jesus came into the world today, they'd kill him again, without a doubt. I believe a lot of Christians would kill him, because that's not their understanding of Jesus. You'd say that cannot happen. Well, who killed Jesus when he came to earth? The Bible-believing Pharisees. Pilate wanted to release him. The Greeks wanted to see him. So I believe with all my heart that if the real Jesus came to earth, the Christians would kill him because they don't want him. He'd take a whip and chase all the people making money out of the church. What happened then? In the name of religion. So it's a very important calling that we have as a church. You have a calling to show the real Jesus. And it doesn't matter if great numbers of people didn't, don't come to the church. Jesus said the way to life is narrow and very few will find it. Why is it narrow? Because he's not telling us how to go to heaven. He's telling us how to be a true witness for God on this earth. That's what I said many years to the Lord in India. Many years ago, I said, Lord, I don't want to go through India finding who wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. I want to find out who wants to walk in Jesus' footsteps here wholeheartedly before going to heaven. I don't want to stand up in a meeting and say, how many of you want to go to heaven? I want to stand up in a meeting and say, how many of you want to give up your love of money? How many of you want to give up your anger, stop shouting at your wife and stop shouting at your husband from today. How many of you want to do that? How many of you want to forgive all your enemies and love them and be good to them? How many of you want to pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you? Tell me, how many of you want to do that? That's what I want to find out. How many of you want to live 100% for eternity and just believe that God will give you enough for your earthly needs. You think there's going to be a big crowd rushing forward to respond to that type of invitation? No. How many of you want to die to yourself every single day that you will not stand up for your rights, but you'll follow in Jesus' footsteps and say, okay, if somebody treats me bad, I just forgive him and move on, believing that God will ensure that I never get tested beyond my ability to bear. How many of you want to bring up your children to live for God more than the world? You know, when you give an invitation like this, there are going to be very few. I'll tell you. And those are the few that find the way to life. We're not here to judge the others. The Bible says don't judge anybody. So I don't judge them. But I say, if I have not, if I claim to be a servant of Jesus Christ, and I don't proclaim the real Christianity that Jesus preached, I am a deceiver. So it's very important for us to be gripped by what is it Jesus gripped by, was valued and appreciated. I thought of three examples that I'd like to just mention of people whom Jesus met, whom he appreciated tremendously. And interestingly, all three were unconverted people. We would never think that Jesus would appreciate an unconverted person. He didn't appreciate their doctrine. They were wrong in their doctrine. But he appreciated their spirit. There are people who are upset with me because I appreciate Mother Teresa. You see, Brother Zach, he's a Catholic. I know. I'm not, I'm not saying I appreciate her doc. Her doctrine is completely wrong. But her life was more godly than the life of many Protestants and Pentecostals. 
And I'd rather follow her life than the life of many pastors and preachers. So I will not follow her doctrine. That was wrong. See, Jesus looks at a life. Here's one example, <clears throat> the first one. John chapter 1. Philip found Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to him in John 1.43, follow me. And you know, he was so gripped by Christ. that In those early days, when a person was gripped by Christ, he immediately wanted to go and tell somebody else. Do you find a burden in your life to tell somebody else about this wonderful Jesus you've met? If you don't have that burden, I want to tell you, you've probably not met Jesus at all. Do you find a great burden in your heart to tell others about Jesus Christ? No. I doubt whether you're a Christian. These early people, as soon as, as, soon as it says here, when Andrew met Philip, he went and brought Peter, his brother. Hey, you see, you got to meet this. Philip, he immediately, as soon as he met Jesus, he went, found Nathaniel, verse 45, and said, Hey, we have found him. Of whom Moses and the law and the prophets said, Jesus, the son of Joseph, and that man despised him. And just like a lot of people despise us when we talk about Jesus. Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Yeah, I know what reputation Nazareth has got. Huh. Nothing good can come from there. Philip said, okay, come and, come and see. Now, how would you respond if somebody despised your hometown? You know, you say you're from such and such a hometown and the guy says behind your back, ah, forget it. I know all the, what reputation that hometown has. You know what Jesus' response was? I want you to listen to this. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming and he gave him one of the finest commendations he ever gave to anybody. There's an Israelite who's got zero hypocrisy. That's what he said. Imagine if Jesus said about you, there's a man who's got zero hypocrisy. What he appears to be on the outside is what he's on the inside, is what he is in private. That's how he lives at home. That's how he lives at work. Exactly what you see, the spirituality, what you see in him on the outside, the way he talks and behaves, is, is genuine. Think of it, my brothers and sisters, if Jesus could say that about you, there is a man, there is a woman who's got zero hypocrisy, zero pretense. He's not acting. He's genuine. I have long meditated on it and said, Lord, with all of my heart, I want you to be able to say that about me. With all of my heart, I'm willing to pay any price. Send me the bill. I'm willing to pay any price. I want you to be able to say that about me because that's greater than getting the Nobel Prize or any other honor in this world. For Jesus to look at me and say, there is a man who is 100% genuine. He's not pretending. He's not pretending when he's in the pulpit. He's not pretending when he's talking to you in private. He is what he is. He's not trying to impress you. He's not trying to show that he's so spiritual. He is what he is. What you see is what you get. That's it. That's what Jesus said about a man who had just said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He wasn't offended by that. Because he was honest. You know that when a prostitute says, I'm just a prostitute, there's no hypocrisy in her. You don't have to be holy to be free from hypocrisy. To be honest does not necessarily mean you're holy. Daniel was not even converted. But he was absolutely honest. And that's the first step to true Christianity. That's what I want to say. The sad thing is, when godless people who are honest when they are godless, say, I'm a sinner. After they become Christians, they become hypocrites. 
because then they're in the midst of other Christians and they've got to show that they're so spiritual and they want to talk spiritual language and get up and talk as if they know so much of the Bible and become more and more hypocrites as they grow. And that's exactly what the devil wants so that they don't progress. Remember this commendation all your life, my brothers and sisters, and covet it that Jesus can say about you, there is a woman, there is a man who is absolutely genuine, no pretense, no hypocrisy. He is what he appears to be. He's exactly what he is in public, he is in private. If you go and live with him in his home, you'll find he's the same person there. He's not preaching something which is not practicing in private. He's 100% genuine. Covet it. It's more important than being known as a great Bible scholar or a great preacher or a great healer. Or I'd rather have this commendation from Jesus than be a miracle worker or something like that. Because most preachers and healers I've met are absolute hypocrites. That's why I value this commendation. So that's the first thing that God looks for. Not holiness, but honesty. Holiness is a peak we have to reach, but to get there we got to start with honesty. Because you can't be holy overnight, but you can be honest immediately. I mean, if you're a prostitute, you just say, well, I'm a prostitute. You're honest. There's no guile in you. But when you're not really holy and you pretend to be holy, you're a hypocrite. Prostitutes don't pretend to be holy. That's why Jesus said, you know what Jesus told to the Pharisees? It's quite an amazing thing in Matthew 21. To the Pharisees who came to him, it says, he's talking in verse 23, Matthew 21, 20, chief priests and elders and all the great scholars of the Jewish people came to him and Jesus said to them in the last part of verse 31, the crooked tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into God's kingdom before you. Can you imagine uh, talking to a crowd of bishops and priests and say prostitutes will get into God's kingdom before you? No preacher would dare to say that. Jesus was daring. And a true servant of Jesus Christ is just as daring because he's not a diplomat, he's not a manager, he's a prophet. Jesus wasn't trying to be popular. He had zero interest in being a popular preacher. He spoke the truth because he loved people so much. It's when we don't love people enough that we are not honest with them about their condition. Think of a doctor who's only interested in your money, doesn't tell you the truth about your condition. It's a sad condition of many preachers today. Jesus said the prostitutes will get into God's kingdom before you. What do the prostitutes have which these Bible scholars do, don't have? Honesty. There he showed us the importance of being honest. They don't remain as prostitutes. When they get become honest, they've taken the first step to be delivered from their sin, sinful life. Honesty, that's what saved the thief on the cross. He just said, I deserve this. I don't deserve 10 years in jail. I deserve crucifixion because I'm so bad. Jesus, really? You belong in paradise. Such people belong in paradise. Compare that with Adam, who was kicked out of paradise. Because when the Lord asked him, did you eat of that tree? He said, well, I'll tell you, Lord, it wasn't really me. I'll tell you the whole story. It began with my wife. And not only that, don't forget, you gave me this wife. Don't, <laughs> don't. These are the exact words you read in Genesis 3. This woman whom you gave me. You see the implication there? You give me this type of wife, what do you expect? <laughs> and I, yeah, I opened my mouth and I ate it. <laughs> this is sort of a postscript. But the main thing is this woman whom you gave me. He was kicked out of paradise. Contrast that with a thief who took the blame himself. 
it's me. It's not my parents that brought me up bad or I got into the wrong company. No, me, 100%. Lord said, come to paradise. I love such people who don't blame others. Uh, you know, we talk about sitting at the foot of the cross. It's a very common expression. I'll tell you whose cross you should sit at the foot of. The foot of the dying thief's cross. Not at the foot of Jesus' cross. Before you get there, sit at the feet of the dying thief's cross and learn from him. Say, Lord, the blame is 100% mine. Not my wife's, not my husband's, not my parents, not this person, that person, not my neighbor's, mine. The Lord will say, today you'll begin the paradise life. I want to live the paradise life on earth. And I know it comes by total honesty. Jesus can say there's no hypocrisy. Covet it, my brothers and sisters, because if you're honest, you will discover a lot of hypocrisy in you. In you, wonderful brothers and sisters, if you're honest, you'll discover some hypocrisy, a certain amount of pretense. You say certain things because you want to convey a certain impression. How do I know? I'll tell you. Because I have the same flesh as you. <laughs> That's what I've discovered in myself. <laughs> but I had to cleanse myself. And as I cleanse myself, I discover, hey, and I know exactly, I don't have to be a prophet to know what type of person you are. I just need to know what I am like. You all came from Adam. But if you cleanse yourself, I tell you, you can come to this wonderful life where you don't have to be always on your guard lest people discover something in your life which you hope they don't discover. No. You come to a relaxed life because you are what you are. then you can proceed to holiness. The biggest hindrance to holiness is hypocrisy. You know, in the Old Testament, that thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, there were things like, uh, don't murder, don't kill, don't... But there was no command saying, don't be a hypocrite. The biggest crimes in the Old Testament were murder, adultery, stealing. Now I want to say to you, if you, in your list of sins, if the biggest are murder, adultery, stealing, etc., you're like an Old Testament Israelite, a good Jew. But a New Testament Christian, you ask, what did Jesus condemn the most? He condemned hypocrisy. So in the number one in your list of sins should not be murder, adultery and all that, but hypocrisy. How many Christians have you met, or you ask yourself, who feel that to me number one sin is hypocrisy? Well, I hate it. That's the first step. Then let me rush through. A second example of another woman whom Jesus a woman whom Jesus appreciated in Mark chapter seven. It's a Canaanite woman, Syrophoenician. It says there Jesus arose from Galilee, Mark seven twenty four, and went to Tyre, and he entered a house and didn't want anybody to know about it but he could not escape notice. And hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit came and fell at his feet. Mark 7.26. The woman was a Gentile. And in Matthew's Gospel, it says a Canaanite. You know that group of people whom Israelites were supposed to kill, but he didn't kill all of them. And because the Israelites did not kill all of them, here was a Canaanite descendant of one of those who were not killed. And she kept on asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. The daughter was not there. The daughter was maybe one mile away in her house. And he said to her, let the children be satisfied first. It's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Imagine calling a woman a dog. Would you do that? Are you holier than Jesus? It's exactly what he meant. You're asking me for the children's bread. Sorry, I can't give it. I don't give it to dogs. Let the children get it. The children meant the Jewish people. And she didn't get offended. 
That's the wonderful thing I want you to see here. She took the place of a dog. I want to ask you, my brother, sister, if somebody called you a dog, would you get offended? Get angry with him? What if Jesus spoke to you like that? I'm not going to give you that. You're a dog. Ask yourself, would you do what this woman did? Lord, okay, I'm a dog. But I can't get the bread. I realize that. Only the children sitting at the table can eat the bread. But the little crumbs and the children eat little crumbs fall down. Can I get a bit of that? That's enough for me. I don't need a whole bread to cast the demon out of my daughter. One crumb is enough to cast the demon out of the daughter. You know that? You know that healing which so many people make much of, casting out demons, is a crumb. It's not the bread. The bread is to become like Jesus Christ. That's the bread in the gospel. Healing, which so many people make much of, is a crumb. Casting out demons is a crumb. And Jesus said, Woman, because of this answer, verse 29, it's an amazing word, because you gave this answer, the demon has gone out of your daughter. I know that your daughter is a mile away, it's gone. Jesus could cast a demon out from one mile away. That's what's given me faith. That when somebody writes to me an email saying I'm demon possessed, I can pray for that demon even though I don't know where that person is. But I see here that Jesus, you don't have to be actually in front of you. And going back home, she found the demon had departed. What she would have missed if she had got offended. Thing. Call me a dog. I had enough of it. So what is the second lesson we learn here? The Lord tests us to see if we will humble ourselves. First is honesty. Second is humility. Be willing to take the low place. That's how we miss out on so much. She was willing to take that low place and she had faith. Humility, it's the humble people who have faith. And you see the Lord's love for, you know, if you want to know, people sometimes say, why did Jesus call somebody a dog? I say, hang on, let me show you something else that he did before he called her a dog. Read carefully. Verse 24. He arose from there, from Galilee, and went to Tyre. I got a map at the end of the Bible and I looked up. Forty miles Galilee to Tyre. No chariots, no transportation. Walk. How long does it take to walk 40 miles? They're not running. And a leisurely play, pace, I would say at least 15 hours. After casting out the demon, verse 31, he went away from there back to Galilee. Another 40 miles back. So I want you to picture this. Jesus is in Galilee. He walks 15 hours, crosses the border of Israel, which he never did. Goes to a place called Tyre because he was prompted by the Holy Spirit. You know, when you live under the touch in the field of the Holy Spirit, you get those type of promptings. And he goes to a house and he says, says here, he didn't want anybody to know it, verse 24, because he came to that town only for one person. So he said, don't tell anybody I'm here. And that one person, the Holy Spirit allowed her to know about it. And she came. He healed her daughter and walked 40 miles back. 15 hours walking, up 15 hours walking to help one person. When I saw that, I said, Lord, make me like you. Make me value one individual who is needy so much 
that I'll be willing to walk 15 hours up and 15 hours back. I want to be a servant of God. That means willing to go through any inconvenience, personal inconvenience, tiredness, exhaustion, okay, but I can help one soul found, find Christ. Now do you believe that Jesus valued this woman so much? He didn't despise her when he called her a dog. Would you walk for 30 hours if you thought somebody was a dog? No, he was testing her. He wasn't despising her. And the fact, it's the only case in the whole Bible, in the whole Gospels, where I read of Jesus walking 30 hours to help one person. This is how a true servant of God is. And that was not even a Jew. And he wanted his disciples to learn something from this. The disciples came with him. Because they, they are the ones who said, tell her to go away. You read that in Matthew 15, the other example. And in Matthew 15, you know, the same story. Jesus said to them, woman, great is your faith. Her humility brought faith in her heart. Matthew 15 and verse 28. When she said, give me the crumbs that fall from the table. That's enough. So his disciples saw something there. And he wanted to show his disciples the, an example in humility. And he couldn't find it anywhere in Israel. Because the Israelites would have all got offended if Jesus had called any of them a dog. It's as it were, he's tell his disciples, I have a feeling that he... On the way back from there, talking, walking with his disciples, he would have told them, you see that woman? Can you people learn something from that person who's never read a Bible? She's a Canaanite. No Bible, no synagogue, no meetings. But look at her humility. That's why she got something from God. So many in Israel don't get. And if you disciples want it, learn humility from her. Learn faith from her. There was a man who brought a child once to the demon, to the disciples and the disciples couldn't cast out that demon from that child. You read that, read about that in Matthew 17. But this woman had her child one mile away and she had faith that Jesus would deliver because of humility. Faith is linked with humility. So that's the second thing the Lord looks for in us. First, honesty. Second, humility. And the third, another unconverted, non-Jewish person whom Jesus appreciated. Matthew chapter 8. These are three outstanding examples of people whom Jesus appreciated. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I know that he will appreciate wherever he sees people having those qualities. Like Nathaniel, freedom from complete freedom from hypocrisy. Like this woman, willing to say, oh, okay, if you treat me that way, I feel I'm a dog, I'm fine. I'm, I don't want some great high position in the church to think that I'm somebody important. The more important you think you are, the more blind you will be to the truth of God. The greatest men of God have been the humblest, always. Matthew chapter 8 there was this centurion who had a servant who was paralyzed at home. He says, came to Jesus in verse 9 and said, Lord, my servant is at home, paralyzed, suffering. And Jesus said, I will come to your house and heal him. And look at his humility. Lord, verse 8, Matthew 8, verse 8, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. <laughs> Ask yourself if Jesus said to you, I will come to your house. You say, sure, come. <laughs> you say, Lord, I'm not worthy for you, holy person like you, to come to my house. I wonder if we miss out on many things because we don't have the humility of these unconverted, godless people. 
I'll tell you honestly, I've learned humility sometimes from unconverted people. I've seen a lot of arrogance in born-again believers. I've seen a lot of pride in believers. Look at this unconverted military man, his centurion. A centurion. The people who say you shouldn't be in the military. Jesus didn't tell him anything like that. He saw humility there in a military man he couldn't find in all these Bible scholars. Because he said, I'm not worthy. He had a humility. First of all, you see his humility. Which military captain would walk so many miles to get his servant treated? First of all. Servants were just despised in those days. But he wanted his servant to be healed. I see a humility there. And this coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come to my roof. So you don't have to come. You don't have to take all that trouble. Just stand here and speak. And my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, amazing faith. Verse 10, I've never seen such faith in Israel. See how he appreciated him publicly. See, that's another thing I've discovered in even among Christians. We don't know how to appreciate people publicly. We are so afraid. We are misers with money and misers with appreciation. I keep on telling children, learn to appreciate your your parents. Write a note of appreciation to your parents for all the, even if they are unconverted. They did a lot of things for you when you were a kid. Express your appreciation. We are very, we are, Christians are very big misers. The world, are, human beings are misers when it comes to appreciation. To express appreciation for your wife or your husband or you just take everything for granted. And sometimes we feel, oh, they may get puffed up if we say something big about them. Didn't you think Jesus would have, did Jesus feel like that? If I say publicly, hey, I've never seen such great faith in Israel, this fellow's head will get puffed up. He didn't have such stupid ideas like we have. That was the difference. Jesus was very different from us. You're afraid somebody will get puffed up. Why? Because we ourselves get puffed up. But other people are not like us. They don't get puffed up. I'm just trying to show you, my brothers and sisters, in a world where Christianity is pictured in a certain way, here is real Christianity which Jesus appreciated. Honesty, humility, and faith like this. I am a man under authority. Matthew 8 verse 9. When I say to a servant, go, Soldier, go. He goes. When I say to another, come, comes. You know, this, I learned something from this verse 9. He recognized when he saw Jesus. And he said, I don't know who this Jesus is, but he's, you know, one military man can recognize another military man. I've noticed that. I was in the military myself for 11 years, and I know. You can make out. This, there's a bearing about some military people you can make out. And Jesus, the centurion, recognized Jesus. Said, I don't know which military he is from, but he's a military man, all right. Because I see him as a man under authority. He's not like a man who's just wandering around without any authority over him. He seems to be a man who recognizes authority. There's no, nothing like the military where people recognize authority. In no private company will you see people submitting to authority like in the military. And he said, I also, verse 9, meaning that Jesus was a man under authority. He was under the authority of the Father. He didn't understand all that theology, but he said, this man is under somebody's authority. I can see that from the little I've observed of his life. He's not one who just goes around doing what he feels like. And therefore he will have authority because he says, I'm like that. I'm a captain of a hundred people. When I tell a soldier to go, he goes. Why? Because when my general tells me to go, I go. That's why I have authority. Because I'm under authority, I have authority. And I, what I learned from that is, why is it that whatever Jesus said happened? Because whenever the Father told him something, he did it. That's what I learned from this verse. The more I submit to God's authority over my life, the more things will happen when I take authority over a situation 
a problem in my life or and I'm looking for an answer to prayer. And a lot of people just don't submit to God's authority in their life and they expect God answers to prayer immediately. Oh Lord, let this happen. It doesn't happen. Because you don't listen to the general yourself. Why should that soldier listen to you? So that's what he learned. He says, when I tell a soldier to go, he goes immediately. And if Jesus tells that sickness to go, it will go immediately. Because he's a man or an authority. It's amazing. That's what faith is. Faith comes through being submitted to authority. And that's the other lesson I learned here of what Jesus appreciated in this man. Faith. I've never seen such faith. A recognition that when you're under the authority of God the Father, you can have faith for amazing things on this earth which other people will not have. Do you wonder why some of your prayers are not answered? Why some things you thought you had faith for didn't really work out. You try to believe, try to believe, try to believe, try to have faith. And you read books on faith and all nothing happens. I'll tell you, the answer is from this verse. You can learn from the centurion. Be 100% under the authority of your heavenly father. When he tells you to do something, do it. When he tells you to go and apologize to your wife for hurting her, do it immediately. Don't wait till the evening. That's what I mean. That's obedience. When a general tells his captain, do this, he does it immediately. And I believe that's a secret. That's a secret of spiritual authority. If God can find you and me, one who's responsive immediately to what the Holy Spirit says in our conscience, do this, do it however inconvenient it may be, do it. You'll find amazing difference when you begin to pray after that. Things will begin to happen, which never, never happened till then. You thought it was because you didn't have faith enough or you didn't use the name of Jesus enough or some technique. The technique is only this. Submit. If you're a person under authority, you'll have authority. God gives you authority, more authority in spirit in situations. Your home. I believe a, a parent can have a spiritual authority over a wayward child if he himself submits to authority. Yeah, you know, some parents they were not serious about bringing up their children properly, and the children are going completely wayward. They say, Now, what shall I do? I'll tell you what. Submit to God's authority, at least now in your life, 100%. And you'll have spiritual authority in your life to solve problems in your home. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the Christianity we have to manifest in this world. It's not Bible knowledge, but it's a life the way Jesus lived. And I believe it's possible for all of us. So, I hope, you know, the, Jesus often spoke in a rambling type of way. The apostles wrote in a rambling type of way, and I've spoken in a rambling type of way this morning. <laughs> I hope it went home to your heart. Let's bow before God. Jesus often used to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I hope you have those inner ears today to hear the most important things that the Lord spoke to you this morning. Father in heaven, we are needy people. Help us to take to heart whatever you spoke to us this morning. We humbly ask in Jesus' name, Amen.